So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the workshop. Uh, my name is Hong Wang. I'm the coordinator of instructional design here in the Center for Teaching Excellence and Learning Technologies at Fort Hayes State University. I'm going to co-present a workshop which is called Maximizing Learning of All Students Using Universal Design. I'm going to co-present this workshop with my colleague and friend, Javier Leong. Do you want to say hi and introduce yourself? Sorry, we have to share this. Well, hi, everyone. Probably all of you know me. I'm Javier Luna. I'm one of the instructional designers here. Okay. So, do you want to say a few words about yourself, your name, and which department you are working, so that we can know each other? Just a very brief introduction. Yeah, That's I'm fine. Well, He's away. I'm, I'm a SIAC advisor. Like I said, I am advising. I'll be, I will be Organizational Leadership and Justice Studies Group, Spiritual College. So that is me. I'm Bridge Go. I'm working on the same college. We'd have you in a moment. I'm Qi Zhang Yao. I'm teaching in the Department of Community Studies. I'm his colleague. I've been here a little bit longer than he has. My name is Connie Heidemann, and I'm also in Communication Studies. Okay, so welcome everybody to the workshop. As we know, this is about universal design. So the first is, you know, what is universal design? Uh, let's watch uh, something first. This is only like a video about like two minutes. Let's finish this. Universal design refers to broad spectrum ideas meant to produce buildings products and environments that are inherently accessible to both people without disabilities and people with disabilities. The term universal design was coined by the architect Ronald L. Mays to describe the concept of designing all products and the built environment to be aesthetic and usable to the greatest extent possible by everyone, regardless of their age, ability, or status in life. However, it was the work of Helen Goldsmith, author of Designing for the Disabled, who really pioneered the concept of free access for disabled people. His most significant achievement was the creation of the draw curve, now a standard feature of the built environment. Universal design emerged from slightly earlier barrier-free concepts, the broader accessibility movement, and adaptive and assistive technology and also seeks to blend aesthetics into these core considerations. As life expectancy rises and modern medicine increases the survival rate of those with significant injuries, illnesses, and birth defects, there is a growing interest in universal design. There are many industries in which universal design is having strong market penetration, but there are many others in which it has not yet been adopted to any great extent. Universal design is also being applied to the design of technology, instruction, services, and other products and environments. Sue's has to do with uh, universal design, but you got the message. I have no idea. That's what this workshop is about. <laughs> okay, so we'll get a little bit general idea about universal design. So basically, originally, the idea itself comes from architecture. So for that, I think most of us are familiar. Anybody can give a quick example of universal design? You know, basically, it, it's a design approach that can be used in many different products, process, including architecture, design of computer lab, design of instruction, design of learning. But one quick example I can think about, I think most of us can think about is, like for example, on campus, for students with disabilities, in traditional buildings, we often have curbs. But for universal design, instead of curbs, we have ramp, right? Electronic doors are also a good example to show universal design. But what we are going to learn today is not about general universal design that will be used in architecture, but it's more related to teaching and learning. So our plan today is uh, a very brief overview of universal design approach. And then the overview of universal design in instruction. Uh, what are some of the basic principles and how to apply those principles in instruction? So that is my part. And then my partner, friend, and colleague, Javier, is going to talk about 
the universal design in learning. So I'm going to continue, and after I finish that, I'm going to Javier is going to talk more about the universal uh, design in learning. All right, let's come to the universal design of instruction. You know, on the surface, maybe some people will say, hey, universal design, is that means one single design approach that fits all the different sizes of the classroom? And actually, it is not. So my understanding is, understand universal design as flexible design. That is the easiest way to understand. It's flexible design can be used in a diverse way. The purpose is to meet the different needs of the students. So that is universal design. It doesn't mean just one single design approach to meet all the students. Basically, it's a flexible design approach that can be used in a diverse way to meet the different needs of the different students regarding their you know, ability, disability, age, or gender, or learning style, or native language, race, ethnicity, and other characteristics. So that is universal design of instruction. But how to apply this principle in the universal uh, in instruction? So we can see that in different aspects of instruction, you know, for example, the class climate interaction, basically all the basic elements of instruction. So let's come to some next is why. You know, why do I need to care? That's one of the things we, we often um, talk about, you know, we know this approach, but why do I need to care about universal design? There are so many instructional design models. Why do I need to care about this one? Now, there's a, let's watch another. Uh, move across the screen. Various scenes let's like. watch another video, but this video is a little bit long. We're going to list all the resources we used during the workshop so that you can watch all of them after the workshop. But we're going to watch part of the video so that you can see the different instructional context, and also you can listen to the comment and talk from different professors, different professors from different disciplines, so that we can get kind of idea of universal design. Students at a computer, a young woman building a paper airplane. A dark-haired student tosses his paper airplane and it lands on a desk. Someone reads a braille document and a man signs. The screen reads, equal access, universal design of instruction, with our host. Hi, I'm Cheryl Bergstaller. I used to be a math teacher. A chalk stick figure is near an algebraic formula. I used to be a technology teacher. The stick figure is near a computer. <laughs> My students were in middle school, high school, college, and online. In all these settings, I've experienced the challenge of connecting to all of my students. The stick figure Cheryl is in front of a class. Three students' smiles turn to frowns. Today, I'm the director of Do It at the University of Washington. The screen reads, Do It. Do It stands for Disabilities, Opportunities, Internetworking, and Technology. Back with Cheryl. Do It serves to increase the success of people with disabilities in education and careers. We have ideas for you on how to reach every student in your classroom. On the computer chalkboard, happy faces stop the screen in a lab. Filling it about halfway up. At every academic level, there are students with a variety of backgrounds, interests, abilities, and disabilities. Some learn best visually. Others are auditory learners. Maybe English isn't their first language. Or perhaps a student has a physical, sensory, or learning disability. The challenge is to maximize learning for everyone in the class. Universal design can help you do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that really the whole notion of universal design is really an exciting concept that really allows a professor to really explore a lot of different methods of teaching and instructing. Al, and one method that does not fit all students. Traditionally, we've always used the oral method of teaching. But universal design offers us other options, more options, therefore we can reach more students. Outside. Universal design isn't new. It's been applied in building construction for many years. Doors with sensors open for everyone, regardless of their size, their ability to walk, their strength, and an armload of books. In education, universal design means instructors anticipate student needs rather than simply react to them. Rodney. I try to teach to all different ability levels, all different interest levels, and so showing them caption videos, 
uh, having discussion groups, finding different ways to, to really capture their knowledge, and kind of breaking out of that traditional mold uh, that I think uh, we've become accustomed to sometimes in higher education. Universal design and instruction strives to make the environment, teaching methods, curriculum materials, and all other aspects of instruction accessible to all students without the need for adaptation or specialized design. The goal is to maximize the learning for everyone. Linda, good teaching is good teaching. And if you use really good strategies, it really benefits everybody in the class, not just the students with disabilities. Universal design can be looked at as a process in which teachers proactively plan for students with diverse characteristics or as a set of strategies for inclusive curriculum and instruction. Great not knowing who you, you have as an audience, what their level of preparation might be, what their life experiences, what their cultural background might be. When you present materials in a variety of different formats, you're going to reach as many individuals as you can and assist them to be successful. Okay, so we stop here for this video. So what did you get from several minutes of this video? Why do we need to care about universal design? So, great. So basically the general goal of the approach universal design is to maximize the, the learning. The most important thing is not to maximize the learning of a specific group of students, but all the students, every student in the classroom. So that is the most important thing. Now, there are some other um, instructional context has also been talked because we care just because the student population has changed so much. You know, we have, we, if we don't talk about other campuses, we're talking here, locally at Fort Hayes. Greg, you have been taught, teaching here for several years, and Connie, you are very experienced. You know, Dr. Yao, you have, everybody here has some teaching experience. So think about the students, how many more international students we have, and how many students from other, from different is ethnic groups, for example, Hispanic students, and uh, how many students with different levels of technology background, with a different language, with different cultural background, you know, with disability or with ability and different learning styles. So that's a ma major purpose we need to care about uh, universal design. Now let's come back to the presentation here. Now, what we have here. Instruction can be applied to lectures. You can continue to watch this video. I will say this workshop since we have limited 60 minutes. And then there is some institutional efforts here related to universal design, although it's not called a universal design, but it's related to the universal design approach. Like one of the committee we have here and some of you are already familiar, is Internationalization Committee, which is hosted by um, the Graduate School, and Dr. Tim Crowney, who is the Graduate School Dean, and also who is the Assistant Provost of Internationalization, is chairing this committee. So this committee is basically um, uh, deals with multicultural, uh, you know, teaching and learning related to uh, those issues, but not only to those issues, and then another committee um, I think we have here at Fort Hayes is Teal for Diversity Awareness. And actually, Dr. Yao, you know that, a couple of you serving on the committee, and I'm also serving on the two committees. It's right now uh, Shiana Meyer and Dr. Robert Moody. Uh, you know, we have a faculty member, we have somebody from Student Affairs. They are co-chairing this committee so that we can considering some of the issues in students, uh, you know, deal with the diversity issues. And this semester, actually, some of the activities from CTO related to course design, we are also trying to plan our activities that relate to those committee um, topics, like uh, one of the instructional design roundtable we hide this semester is strategies to create an inclusive learning environment. And another one is about multi multiple means of uh, presenting course materials in the online teaching and learning. Now with that being said, we let's take a quick look at uh, universal design principles. As we watch the first two minute video, 
we know the universal design uh, originally comes from architecture. Uh, it is not only used in architecture to make buildings, you know, environments accessible to all people, you know, including people with disabilities, but it can be also used in different other environments, products and processes. Uh, so take a look at here, for example, the first one, equitable use, you know, that including all the users and flexibility in use. But these seven principles are general principles. So um, how these principles can be applied for in, in instruction, we talk about that because our focus is on universal design of instruction and how it is related to universal design in learning. So let's, um, sorry, let's come to the next one is the process, universal design of instruction, how it is used in the process, and what are some of the examples we can see in our teaching so that you feel like, well, this is not something abstract, this is something concrete, I can get an idea, okay? So let's take a quick look at the process. Um, you know, for the seven universal design principles, when we connect that to the instructional design process, basically we can see there are seven steps. And the first one is identify the course. That is basically refers to the instructional goals of your course. What's that course? Is it undergraduate course? So um, graduate course is a general education course, basically related to the general uh, goals of the course and the instructional context of a specific course. And then the second one, de define the universe. That is more, I think, for the instruction and learning. It's more referred to um, the student, the target users of the student, of the course, the overall student population, and the specific characteristic of the students. For example, do I have any international students in my class? Um, what are their native language? Uh, do I have any non-traditional students in addition to traditional students? Do I have any students with disability? Do I have any students who oh, really prefer the audio, you know, auditory learning style instead of video learning style? So basically just kind of analyze the students' characteristics. And then involve students that relate to the second one. You know, if you have students with disability, you have to uh, get the students involved with different campus support units, such as like for students with disability here at Fort Hayes, we have to work with Kenny Center with resources. For students who have um, need more tech support, we'll work with CTL, and work with uh, Computer Center, you know, things like that. Now adopt instructional strategies and apply instructional strategies basically based on the initial analysis design your course and plan for accommodation basically that's the development stage and that's one evaluation. So if we look at this, it's really pretty much similar to our instructional design model. If we don't think about uh, insurance model or motivation model or any other models, we only talk about Andy model, which basically most of faculty are familiar with. That is a five stage, you know, you analyze your uh, class and students, you design your course, and then transfer your design to development stage, and then evaluate, implement, and then evaluate, add it. So basically, this is very similar to that process. The first two is related to the analysis stage, and then design and development and evaluate. So there is not really much difference. So what I'm going to uh, share with you, the rest part of, of the workshop for my part, is going to share some examples with you to see, hey, uh, the universal design of instruction can be applied in all aspects of instruction, such as the classroom climate, uh, interaction, or some other things like a physical environment, process, providing feedback, evaluate assessment, learning assessment, and also like providing resources. But again, we said this is at the very beginning, I said this is a very basic workshop and we have two parts. So there is no time to talk about all the aspects of instruction. What I did 
what I'm going to do is pick up three aspects of instruction, which will be um, related to what Javier is going to talk in the second half of this workshop. So what I'm going to share is, the first is how to relate classroom activity or classroom climate to universal design, how to relate interaction to universal design, and how to relate the information resource and technology to universal design from the instruction side. And then Harvard is going to talk about universal design of learning from three parts. One is multiple means of representation, multiple um, means of expression, and multiple means of engagement. So there's three parts from instruction side and from learning side, just kind of we connected the dots together to give you a whole picture, okay? Now the first one, here I'm talking about the class climate. And as you know, you know, class climate, we can think about many strategies, how to make your students feel welcome, you know, just no matter what's their background, you know, cultural background, uh, the, f the native language and learning styles. Uh, for some small regular size of class, I think it's very easy to handle. But I'm more think about large classroom and its online environment. What are some of the things we can, we can do to welcome students? Any free sharing? We'll force them to introduce themselves in Great. The class, especially Great. the online classes, yeah. get a sense of who their classmates are. Yeah, to add that personal presence and human face in the online learning environment. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So make, um, let me get some example here. Yeah, Greg mentioned, you know, just welcome the students. So there are so many ways to welcome your students in an uh, online class. You can, a simple way is a text message, a welcome letter. Some of the faculty are doing that. And for this one, we have an audio welcome message. We can play one second. So. Hello, everybody. That's one second. <laughs> that. So that is one second. Now, we talk about like make it accessible to all students. The main reason I show you the audio is not only just the audio, but I also I want to show you there is a text transcript. Maybe you have a student who have hearing impairment. So it would be nice to provide the text transcript so that they can read the uh, text. OK, I will come back. Yeah, yes, just one second. Yeah, so this is one way, and then there are some other ways, you know, uh, make your welcome message. Some other strategies we can think about is address uh, special needs in your syllabus. Most of us deal for students with disability, you know, if you need a special needs, if you are students with disability, you know, feel free to contact the instructor and using the resource from Kenny Center. And there are a couple other things that I also do but I'm going to ask you to share, after I share, uh, to address uh, if I have international students. I do address that, you know, because sometimes there are, is language issues for the classroom. So if they need any special need, uh, feel free to let me know, and also technology need. For the online class, we don't know whether that specific student is the first time to take an online class, like your course, you know, last time. I think your Greg did a very good job last time, you know, mention that, hey, if you need a special need for Blackboard, here is a, some resource, or feel free to contact me. So to address those different issues, different needs in the class, that's a good example to make your students, all kinds of students, welcome. And another thing, I think this is miss popular in online learning environment, since we cannot see um, much video cues, but in uh, on-campus classroom, I think, you know, try to avoid this stereotype, you know, maybe sometimes we think, well, a certain group of students are smart, or a certain kind of group of students maybe not. So try to avoid those kind of stereotypes because we have to do that based on their performance. So that is about climate. Another thing I do, I also think about is make us as online instructors available and approachable in the online classroom, like contact information, virtual office hours, things like that. 
Okay. The second one is about interaction. Um, I think for the online class, we'll talk about interaction, not only interaction, interpersonal interaction, but also interaction between the students and content, and then the interaction between students, the interaction between the instructor and the students. A uh, couple of examples I want to talk, since I'm watching the time here, and it's about time for Javier. In the classroom, I think we speak clearly to our students, use a simple language. Just maybe we have an international students whose native language is not English, make sure they understand. And another thing is I think we try to avoid some jargons using some simple language. That is also important. And try to um, think about some special situation. I will take like, for example, the conference. For example, the virtual office classroom, uh, virtual office hour. When I said about virtual office hour, um, I do not require webcam, but I do require my students to use a headset for the audio part, but I do not require them for the webcam. One is because of the limitation of the video capability of Skype or Adobe Connect. And another thing is I think about my students maybe from a rural era of the country and then it will take more time, more bandwidth for that internet connection. So instead of think about those special issues when we plan our course, that is uh, important as well. Now this one thinking about uh, information resource and technology, that is more related to um, I think the multiple means of representation which Harvard is going to talk about but I only show a couple of examples in my uh, teaching, and then I will pass to Javier. Okay, this is a <clears throat> this is some of the self uh, paced learning modules for our faculty who would like to know more about course design and online learning. So this one is a um, graphic to show the learning objectives of a module. But at the same time, we also have the text and a module introduction. Uh, here, let's play just one second. Okay, so you get the idea. That's a different way um, of presenting information. But then there are a couple other things I will show very quickly about engagement. Uh, for example, in the um, you know, instead of text, we have video uh, using as a teaser to introduce the topic for a specific module. And then we also have uh, online assessment and have some interactive online polling to engage students. So by showing a couple of examples uh, in creating welcoming class climate related to interaction activities and information resource, I'm going to pass that to uh, Javier. Um, Just to get a temperature check, is everybody comfortable with universal design? Universal of learning now, so. Of instruction? Okay, great. All right. If we have any questions, we can do some discussion. So this is the part that I need a second to put this microphone on. Okay, so. We love technology. Yeah, we love technology that sometimes it handicaps us. Um, Okay, so universal design for learning is not a subset of universal design of instruction. What it is, what you have right now in front of you, it's an actual framework. And my purpose here is to 
uh, narrowed down how we provide uh, more opportunities for students from a curriculum or content development. We already um, uh, took uh, take a look at how we can maximize those opportunities regardless of deliver delivery method from your instruction in, in the traditional classroom or in the online environment, uh, rearranging uh, the tables or having the right technology in your course. But my main purpose is to how we utilize this framework to maximize the content that we present to the students regardless of the delivery method whether it's online or traditional classroom or blended. So. So universal design for learning derives from learning sciences, and there's a lot of mumbo and jumbo science behind that. Um, so basically what it relies, and the images did not load here properly, is that this framework relies on three aspects of brain science. The way, the first one, it's multiple ways of representation. It's how the, the, the brain recognizes different patterns, different types of content that we see, that we sense. Um, the second one is strategic networks, means that how do we perform those tasks? Is depending on your learning style, are, are we visual learners? Um, are we auditory learners? What kind of learner are you? And effective networks is how do learners stay motivated and how we can sustain that motivation through the development of, of, of engaging content or even choosing the right content or providing different ways to represent the same content and keep your students motivated. So I'm going to reveal all of these because this is not mystery here. So the principal one is, and this is an entire rubric, and I know we have a very limited time. I'm not going to go through 1.1. I'm a fan of rubrics, by the way. I'm not going to go through every single point, but I'm going to highlight every single uh, principle. The first principle is to, like I said, provide multiple ways of representation. The second one, uh, provide students with opportunities to express what they know, to showcase their learning, uh, their performance. And the last one, it's find different ways to engage your students, whether it's through a podcast, through a voice thread, or a video introduction like you did in Articulate Hong. Um, okay, so, ooh, look at that. This is where technology works beautifully. Um, there's supposed to be a note here, but anyway. this for a moment. Um, okay, so I'm going to go through every, uh, every principle and show you examples of how we can create uh, or choose different open educational resources that we have available. So the first one is, uh, how many of you have used avatars? Of course you did, huh? So, it could be in Blackboard, it could be anywhere, online, <laughs> offline. <laughs> so for example, if you haven't tried Vokey.com, um, it lets you create free avatars and you can choose your own persona. And of course, you're not going to choose, this is for a K-12 example, so you don't want to really portray your teaching persona as an alien from Mars. but this is a talking head and you can type, there are different ways to input your information. Go to Vokey.com and it will let you uh, record, type um, a video introduction and it, it's up to 60 seconds. Um, that's the only downside, it's not meant to deliver the entire instruction with Vokey, but just to grab their attention. Um, okay. So. What, this is one of the greatest websites that I've seen. Um, it's for students with disabilities, and you may not run with this all the time. Uh, this is more of storytelling, and they use sign language. And you, you will hardly ever f run with, with this example, but it's, it, it's geared toward kids with students with disabilities, and I provide a story uh, behind that. And, they put a lot of effort in animating uh, every single component and having someone who just doing the sign language here. 
So that's uh, sciencestories.com. You may never use it in your life, but if you know someone, um, that would be really helpful so that those type of stories are not deprived from those stories. Go ahead. Yeah. Does it translate sentences for you? Uh, or do you have to use sign language beforehand? It does the sign language first, and there's a transcript. Right. It doesn't translate, though. For international so students, I can't tell them what my welcome is or what my speech is, and then it will put it in. Sign right. This is like pre-made leapfrog type of thing. So you cannot really tweak. It's not a service. It's already done for you. I mean, um, just pick up the story. Though. Right. Just pick a story that you want to deliver, and it's all free. Um, okay. I'm gonna close that alien. It's freaking me out. Um, <laughs> So how many of you use concept maps in your courses? Uh, anyone? Sometimes. Sometimes. OK, why, why do you use concept maps? Well, when students have a question, then I think I need a map to answer their question. That's great. I, you know, that's my approach. When, when a process is too complicated and I want them to simplify, I give them a concept map, like this one. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I have the example in front of myself, like in front of me. I'm like, go. Oh, how am I doing this? So besides this example, there's another example. So if you go to visualworks.com, this is uh, another way to uh, visualize a dictionary by connecting the dots. So you enter, the, um, you enter a word. Let's see what it can find. World. So it, 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 it it makes those, it doesn't only give you the, uh, it doesn't give you the description, but it gives you the connections of uh, this node connects to global planetary worldwide. Um, maybe you can use this as a teaser in your courses if you're teaching English uh, 101, English comp. Um, this is a good way to put in your announcements or like an opening in your presentation or have students to analyze why the connections, why this node is not closer to this one. You can get creative with all these kind of things. So, so it's, that's visawords.com. So um, you, the only thing that you have to be careful is that when you open the site, the words are random. And when I opened the site, uh, it, there was a word that it was a, a bad word there. Uh, so you have to be careful. You have to choose, pre-select your words ahead of time. So a little FYI there. So, um, so I think Hong already showed you uh, QWiki when she gave you the definition of universal design uh, of instruction. And what it's different about QWiki is that we have, we're, we're so much used to reading like wikipedia.org, which is a great resource. And, but if you go there to QWiki.com, it gives you an alternative. I call it the Visual QWiki because it provides you the audio visuals and the collage that it's moving and providing you the captions for it. So if you want to, um, it's like a Google search page. And if you search uh, for Hayes State University, It will give you the, there's audio, but it's disabled. Um, it will go through a player here, and it will give you the caption. And this is great because with, for students with disabilities or students out of the library, they can just turn on the, the volume. They just read the subtitles here. But when you click one of uh, the collages here, you can explore um, the map or any image that has been shown. And you can get creative with these. Uh, I usually use this as an introduction to a module, or you can ask student, okay, go to QWiki, uh, I'll give you a set of topics, and you dig in more information and build a report from there. And they can explore within the QWiki itself. So I'm in the map, I get out. That's, but, not, that's not Hayes. Let's pretend that it's Hayes, okay? Um, uh, let's pretend that it's Hayes. Oh, Kansas City. Oh, how could you miss four hours? <laughs> there, <laughs> but it, 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 I mean, the, the limitation with QWiki is that 
you cannot find very complicated terms like the you name it but um, just for simple terms just to engage your students here and depending on the topic it will have more collages in here uh, more pictures that they can explore so it's up to you to explore those choices and you can embed that in Blackboard or in a PowerPoint presentation if you choose to um, so different ways to engage your students to motivate them um, one of the things that we're starting to promote here at the institution is the uh, open educational resources and there's so much wealth out there that it can save you time in course development regardless whether you teach online or blended whatever uh, any or regardless of the delivery mode um, this resource here oh my god that's a pretty long so this is an example of uh, an ESOL class um, there's and probably Connie would the communication uh, faculty would benefit from this is that there's all kinds of activities if you go to ESOL online I'm not going to read the entire URL but uh, .tki.org you can search all kinds of instructional activities and that's an entire library I just chose this particular um, um, activity just to show you how they have an entire lesson built for you I mean of course you're not going to copy and paste the lesson but you're going to reference to to that page um, there's a wealth of open educational resources that you can use like search engines that I wish we could devote an entire session to search and exploring those options so any questions so far Am I losing you? Yes, no? Okay, great. Okay. So I'm really excited about infographics and how we can visualize uh, information beyond, to, beyond of what we're used to reading. Um, and this is a great example that students, I mean, even though this is a, a, a tool for K-12 for students to visualize uh, data, uh, they can create their own graphs. They can create bar charts, line, area pie charts, area charts. Of course, we can tell your students, hey, go build that in Excel. But this is a great interface that they can go and build their own. And they can choose the type of, the type of chart that they want, uh, enter the, da uh, the data, um, add the labels, just like in Excel, but it provides a better interface for students. And if you want your students to not just to articulate what they know but visualize it and post it on a discussion board this is a great way to um, to do that and of course I have zero zero but you know what I mean here so so interactive posters uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, Glockster yeah, of course you do uh, <laughs> so Glockster is a uh, imagine that you're looking at a poster, but this is a poster that you can uh, interact with. And this is an example of a high school. And they created a poster here with a description of it, and they can include video. Um, and you can embed all kinds, of all, all kinds of great things, manipulate images, and create your own posters. So, so how do we use posters? It's when we deliver, deliver content. For example, if we're referring to a psychology lab, you can create images. And some of those images are already done for you in Glockster. Or you can upload search, search in Google and upload them to Glockster for free. Um, and create that metaphor. If you're talking about psychology lab, like a writing lab, you can get a write, actual writing lab. and put posters around it and type the information that you want to deliver. You can also link to PDF documents that you have in your uh, that that you have in your um, on your websites or external websites and you can create that learning experience or that design metaphor. So you can try Glockster dot, uh, dot com. Don't try the EDU because they're gonna charge you, but if you want to play it's all for free. Uh, you can take it, you can display it on the website, you can take it to Blackboard anywhere you want. So I'm probably for advising if you want to create a newsletter or a poster, 
about the virtual college or a particular program, you can start creating there. And we have lots of multimedia that we are we that you can reuse and import within the project. Okay. So this is the boring part. And this rubric, and it's all in your handout. <clears throat> And I can send you the link to my concept map here. So because I didn't go through, this is like assignment for you to go through over the, the next, this week, and I'll send you a quiz through Lotus Notes. Um, you can download this rubric. Um, you, go for the, uh, you go to the UDL Center or the Center for Applied Special Technology. Well, I linked the actual document, but... Uh, and you can download the actual organizer from the UDL Center. And it's the same one here. And if you go to that site, it has more examples of learning objects, external resources that you can reuse. Um, let me go back. So this is a, another resource. This is more of the educator's checklist. Uh, instead of having that little chart, it gives you an actual list of things to look for when you uh, choose content or develop content from scratch. And you put your, uh, it goes by the same principles and it breaks down the rubric by it. And some of them will not be applicable depending on your expertise and the intent of the course. And I think regardless of what you teach or what you do, universal design applies to every, everything, pretty much. So, um, and I'll send you a link. Um, if you haven't signed up the roster, please do, and I'll do a little follow-up uh, with, um, with a link to the concept map. Um, I'm not high enough. Wait, there you go. All right. So, any questions so far? And oop, let me go to this link here. And this is where the um, the Center for Applied uh, uh, Special Technology all comes from. And if you go to the cast uh, dot org uh, forward slash udl, you can see an overview of those principles. Um, you can actually go to the examples and resource, and they have plenty of examples. I just picked the ones that picked my brain that day. Um, but it goes in very much detail and you can choose by checkpoint or by rule breaking here. So uh, they're pretty neat stuff here. I really encourage you to do uh, to just to do a little bit of digging. We actually put all the resources together. Right. We have a print copy here and then I'm going to send you your electronic Right. So right. Right. This handout here has both uh, universal design uh, for instruction and learning here, um, because universal design for learning it's an actual framework. I try to keep it as one pager as possible, but I'll send you the link to the concept map, and it has all the links that you need to know. So, have any questions or things you would like to add or experiment or? Okay, great. It's endless, isn't it? Yeah, it is endless. It's so endless. I mean, where does it stop? Where is it going to stop? Um, until we'll, we keep innovating as human beings. So we just keep That's thinking. Awesome. What is self aware to be used to create this presentation? I'm sorry? What is self aware to be used to create this presentation? You mean when or? Which? It's a oh, the concept map. Yeah, yeah you know, it's if you mind42.com, uh, you can create your own concept maps. What I've done is I embedded it in Blackboard. I embedded it here in Blackboard, and the reason I took it out is because it takes space. And I love working with this smart web where it just feels like a little iPad, little iPad. I can't believe I said that. Um, but, oh, look at that. It loaded all the images. That's weird. 
Right, so you can really zoom uh, and out. And this is more suitable for, it depends what you want to do. If you teach traditionally, if you want a constant map, that's great. But if you teach online or or face to face, you want students to showcase what they know or work collaboratively, they can put their concept maps together, um, and they they can attach notes, links, images, anything they want. It's for free. So, mine, forty two dot com. Okay. So is there anything specific that you want to apply in your in your courses? Or you're looking forward to something? Well, I, well if you could go back to where you were, there was 5.1 over on the right hand side and it was talking about media for communication. I would want to be yeah. 5.1 point 5.1 media for communication. Yeah. And you chose that because you're in communications, right? Yeah. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go through every checkpoint, it gives you the checkpoint itself and a bunch of examples here. Um, Animoto, it, if you haven't done movies with characters animating them, you can use Animoto. Um, just animation yeah, tools. Animation. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't tried. I create, I tried Sam. That's a great tool. And it will tell you, you know, the good thing is it summarizes you the tool and it tells you whether it's free or not. Um, but, and there's voice thread. Yeah, that's, um, book builder. Hmm, you're going to create a book. How interesting. Scrap block. Scratch. Right. Go to the UDL center dot org. Uh, there's there's lots of them. Lobster, and just don't be um, don't be um, around just one tool and one checkpoint. Depends on what you want to use it for, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure there's plenty of resources that you would satisfy different rubrics or checkpoints. Crayon, kids poetry. Look at that. Arts Lab Studio, Studio. Okay. Tools for composition and construction. I don't know if that really pertains to. Yeah, most of these are geared writing. towards you know K through twelve. Right. I mean, they're still used that you can use within. Um, right. There's for math, math calculators, spell checker. Who knew? So go check it out. Um, it's a great resource, and I'll send an email with a concept map with all the links so in I there. I can show you a, some of the examples of mm -hmm. our voice here, Animoto and Zagoki. Sure. If you, I, I don't mind. Do mind? Okay. No, I don't mind at all. I mean, how that is embedded in Bravo in the course, and we can, I even don't need that. This is one of the examples how we were talking about earlier about the monkey thing. You know, we hire faculty sometimes who do not feel comfortable with your, your own pictures or video. So you can go to workpeed.com, just create a username, password, and you can create something. So what I did here is just type the text I want to speak, but really it's not my personal voice, but it's <laughs> somebody oh else. Goodness. Yeah, you can listen to that. So basically you just kind of type your Hello, this is Hung Wang from the Center for Teaching Excellence and Learning Technologies at Fort Hayes State University. That sounds kind of like it a, is, oh, yeah. it's not a real voice, but that's one of the examples. And then the... Um, you can also call in to Moki and record your actual voice oh, because okay. this is a transcript yeah. that's computer okay. generated. So you can call in from your phone and record your actual mm -hmm. voice or your microphone on your computer. Mm -hmm. At least you got the hair color right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
tell what the which were not the close should be for the things here. So many conferences now that are international, you can they have their own embedded stuff and you can automatically do it electronically. Yeah. Just talk over your slides or whatever. Slide share is a good. Well, you can uh, record audio with slide share. Yeah, this is one of these um, about mm -hmm. voiceway. How we are talking about earlier, mm -hmm. it's free for the basic use. You can. It's kind of cloud-based application. So basically, you go to voiceway.com, create a free username and password, and you can talk in the beginning. So this one basically is kind of video discussion. I uh, using that uh, to replace a traditional discussion board. So maybe you will like it as a different way for the communication studies. Uh, this is a discussion about um, different technologies in distance education. So you can hear what the students talk about. Either it's audio or video, depending on... Hello, uh, this is Christy Corpstein, and this is my voice thread post about Skype. I just recently started using Skype. And so this is one of the students' participation. Uh, this student is using Webcam. So Hello, I'm Megan yeah. Side. I am doing mine over Skype. I have been using Skype for the past seven years. I started using it when... So we don't have to hear all of them, but if you get an idea. Another thing is, I think for voice it is uh, we notice it as a sign language. That's another thing which is good for accessibility issues for students who have um, hearing impairments. Mm -hmm. You can hook up with a web hand and using a sign language. So students can watch that as well. And then ad model, maybe one more example. Uh, I think I also used it that. Um, basically, the good thing about ad model is, you know, usually we think video production takes professional skills. Uh, it does, but for faculty, you don't have time to do that. Um, there is a simple way to do that. Basically, you go to admodo.com, you can create um, a free account. And then what you need to do is, you really don't need to use any editing skills. You only need uh, images, and then type some text. There, of course, you can also upload some videos and add some background music so that uh, it will be a very um, simple video. You can use that for different reasons. Like this one, I use it as a different way of introducing myself. You can also use it as a teaser to introduce a module or things like that. We can watch maybe just one second. And the background music, it's they provide you with a library of background music. You don't have to make your own. So we don't have to watch one of them, but you get the idea. So this one, I have like three parts of the introduction video. The first part is about myself, and then the screenshots of some of the web design projects. And the second part is about my interaction with faculty, with students, and last part is about family and personal life. So but you get the idea how that will work. So just some examples in real. Um, did you have any students use this for career services, finding jobs? Like if I'm looking for a job as a student, I can use any old one and put myself in and say this is what I have, the skills and knowledge. And well, definitely you can use that. But for the students I have, I just teach, for, teach courses for the instructional sure. technology courses. Sure. Mm -hmm. They do, some of the students use it as a you know, to or to create something, but not really for career. Very but I would say for career services, looking for, for jobs, job hunting, resumes, it would be much better to create an electronic portfolio, I would say, to include all their like, mm -hmm. uh, projects and courses, a different information. Mm -hmm. Electronic portfolio would be a better uh, option. Is I there a website for the students to create their uh, digital portfolio? I'm sorry. Do you, do you know any website? About <coughs> that? Yeah. You know, there's some good uh, tools, but one thing I can think about is Google Sites can be a right. good option 
The only thing is um, you have a Gmail account and you have the free storage space and you don't need much web design skills. There are lots of templates there you can create. And then there's some other one, one more tool before we close. Um, uh, LiveBinders.com. That is another one. But that's another yeah. one. It, it, it gives you all the tabs on top and you can create your own tab. It's like a folder system. You can create your own topics and you can dump anything. And it's a free one. Right? It's a free one. What do you call it? LiveBinders.com. Live L-I-V-E Binders, B-I-N-D-E-R-S.com. A lot of uh, higher, um, higher, I mean, a lot of high school teachers uses it, but it's also part of time. Right, it's free that you can create lots of things in the portfolio. Okay, right. Any other questions? Any other questions? Comments before we close? You guys are really good resources yeah. for free software. Yeah. I hope it stays for free. <laughs> I cannot guarantee that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Free tool.